Hi everybody, welcome to Cam Cycles December monthly meeting. Uh, we have our guest speaker Sam Davies already here with me. Hi Sam. Hello Roxanne. Thanks for joining us. Oh, pleasure. Before we kick off the details of the monthly meeting and Sam starts her her talk, I would like to let everybody know that the Big Give Christmas Challenge is now live. Um, so that means that for the next few days, if you make a donation to Cam Cycle via our uh, Christmas challenge, your donation will be doubled. And that this year, it's really important because we know we've got a huge amount of work coming up in the next year to build on the, I think, reimagination that the public is having for our public spaces. We've seen what uh, less traffic can do during the pandemic. We've seen the need for more space for cycling, walking, just being outside. Um, and we need to campaign quite hard next year to keep building on that progress. So that is what our funds raised from the Big Give Christmas Challenge will be for. And we have a very big target this year. Uh, we are trying to reach 15,000 um, pounds. And that means we've got seven and a half thousand pounds already gifted ready to double any donations that come through over the coming days. But I'll stop talking about it and I will play the video because that's much better. Here we go. Places to breathe for me is being able to cycle wherever I need to with my whole family and not feel unsafe. Cycling on the smooth part of country roads in clear, bright, unfumed air, unhassled by passing vehicles. You can just relax and take time to see all the nature around you. Look around where you live and what you haven't seen before. Seeing, you know, all the groups of students cycling to school together in the morning. The benefits of the people who live and work here. So thank you to our members who have already sent us some great quotes about what Spaces to Breathe means for them. Uh, and you can double your donation to CamCycle right now at camcycle.org.uk forward slash big give 2020. Uh, and we have already uh, raised over, uh, I think, 1,200 pounds just in, the, in a, a few hours today. So hopefully we can work our way through the rest of those um, funds waiting to double donations. Um, and of course, if you've got um, a photo or a story or a quote that you'd like to share about what Spaces to Breathe means to you and why this is important, uh, we would love to hear that. But anyway, enough from me, it's time to hear from Sam. <laughs> so today for our monthly meeting, we are joined by Sam Davies. Now, uh, Sam, I, I said this to you before, you wear many hats, so I'm not always sure how to introduce you, but let's start with the big news. Now, Sam Davies, MBE uh, from the Queen's Awards just this year. So congratulations, Sam. Well Thank done. You, Sam. <laughs> so you now will have to remember to call you Sam Davies, MBE. No, and please don't. <laughs> please don't. Okay, you insist. I have too much responsibility. <laughs> and that is for, I guess, services to your local community. And, and, and I, what I find quite interesting is that this is, as Sam Davies, you're part of the Queen Edith's Community Forum, uh, but also you sort of stand alone in the way that you have coordinated activity in your community about transport, responding to planning applications. I know you're also involved in the mutual aid work, food hub work in your local area as well. And not only that, but you're also studying a master's in urban studies. And I just found out today that Cam Cycle is one of your uh, your uh, subject Head studies. Yep. Yeah, brilliant. But I'm sure that you can talk about it better than I can. Um, but we're really excited to have you here tonight. Uh, and we invited Sam to speak to us because we're really interested in the work you've done to bring your community together. And we want to hear about what you've done, but see what we can learn for Cam Cycle as well and how we can help other communities to to get together and, and I think become quite a force um, like you've done in Queen Edith's. So without any further ado, Sam, I hand it over to you. You may share your screen and 
speak as you like. Oh, I'll say one more thing. This is about a conversation and Sam's very keen to hear questions. So please get them coming um, on Twitter and Facebook. If you need to email me or send me a text message, whatever you like, I will get those questions to Sam. Over to you. Great. So is, is my presentation sharing at the moment? I'm not seeing it yet, no. Okay, then we will do that. Okay. Perfect. All right. So um, that was a very generous introduction from Roxanne, um, but she's right on one thing. <laughs> she's right on the fact that um, neighbourhood and locality and place are really important to me and underpin everything that I have been working towards for the last five years, I guess, through the community forum. Um, to deal with the hats issue, I should clarify that I am going to talk a little bit about the community forum this evening, because that's been sort of the big engine through which we've got things done. But I'm not speaking on behalf of the community forum, I'm speaking as me, which is why you are saved the sight of me wearing one of those obnoxious bright pink t shirts. Um, and we will we will take it from here. So really, I wanted to talk about four things, um, me and cycling, just so you get a sense of um, my involvement, um, a bit about Queen Edith's in case there are people on the, the call who are not familiar with it, uh, about the community forum as an organisation, but then about cycling in Queen Edith's and how it fits with the bigger picture of what we are trying to achieve. So fingers crossed. And I, I this, this quote for me sums up the whole kind of enterprise. The neighbourhood is the unit of social change and we should prize our neighbourhoods and foster our neighbourhoods a lot more than we currently do. Oh, and why is it not advancing to the next slide? Hang on. Sometimes it likes to change the controls. Um, maybe bottom left, there might be. Something. Ah, there we are. Okay, right. So um, this slide kind of captures different bits of my relationship with cycling. So um, bottom left, uh, when I was young and fit, we used to do a lot of cycle touring, uh, mostly on a tandem. And I have hugely happy memories of those days, though I cannot see currently that I'm likely to be able to revisit them. Uh, then we had children, we towed them around in trailers and we got them on bikes themselves as soon as we possibly could. And you can see um, from the photo in the middle there, uh, that's taken at the top of the tourmalet in the Pyrenees and the boys are wearing well in wheelers kit they were cyclists for Well in Wheelers Junior Cycling Club for about, God, seven years. Um, and it became a, an incredibly important bit of our family life. Um, and even though they don't race anymore, they are still, you know, extremely adept on a bike. And one of the things I guess I'm quite passionate about is opening up, opening up opportunities for sports cycling for young people because I've seen the confidence and the skill set that it gives them. Uh, my first bit of um, campaigning involvement, I guess, uh, was when I did, I think it was about 18 months or two years on the Cam Cycle Committee in the early 2000s. And um, one of the events that I organized uh, in conjunction with, with other people got Chris Boardman down here um, to, to try out some very strange contraptions. Uh, then family took over. And then in 2013, when I was starting to cycle kids to school a lot, um, I began to think about Long Road as a place and how incredibly unpleasant it is to cycle, particularly with small children, but even uh, I find just as an adult. So I got a petition together just as a, a you know, civilian um, 
presented it to the county council and much to my great surprise they they uh, initially agreed to a thousand a hundred thousand pounds worth of improvements but actually in the end i think it was more like 150 thousand pounds worth of improvements and that that felt um really meaningful as an achievement it was sticking a toe in some water that i hadn't previously um been that knowledgeable about and it paid dividends and since then i've gone on um through the community forum and also through my involvement in smarter cambridge transport to try and learn more and do more to embed cycling and sustainable transport more generally in our neighborhood but also to think about how that relates to community um, and I'll come back to that later and how those things are complementary and whether there's also tensions between them. So just in case anybody doesn't know where Queen Edith's with, we are the bit in the south of the city next to the biomedical campus, which is neither Trumpington nor Cherry Hinton. We are a bit of an anonymous suburb. We don't have much of an identity um, other than the things we aren't. Um, it's fairly low density housing. The character of it is changing a lot at the moment um, as family houses are replaced with flats, but and, and as we get some urban fringe development, but the absolutely overriding factor you need to know about Queen Edith is that, that it lives and breathes in the shadow of the biomedical campus and that determines pretty much everything that happens in and around this area. Um, and an often overlooked adjunct to, to that is that in fact, this area also hosts uh, a number of sixth form colleges and um, schools where such that we host 55% of the of Cambridgeshire counties year 12 and year 13 students. And I, my experience is that the biomedical campus and its needs has out shouted the need to think about those students and their requirements for a very long time. And it's one of the things that I'm quite keen to address. So we did some mapping for a project I'll, I'll come on and talk to you about in a minute um, about what the area's got and what it hasn't got and that plays into my thinking about what we can do to um, make this a, a, a better place to be if you like and I think the one thing that stands out for me from this map is the further south you go in Queen Edith's the less there is here. Um, the black dot in the bottom left is the uh, retail on the concourse at the hospital, which clearly has been off limits for um, the vast majority of this year and has been off limits at various points in the past um, when there have been you know, norovirus outbreaks uh, and so on in the hospital. And yet the development that is happening on the southern edge of Queen Edith still refers to the retail offer on the hospital as the nearest available shopping. And it staggers me that we are so short-sighted in terms of how we provision new areas and make sure that they have the amenities they need such that people don't get in the habit of getting in cars. They don't assume that's an automatic way of moving around the area to meet their needs so so that that map for me and the, the the sort of investigation that went on around it was confirmation of something i think i knew innately anyway which is there is a real geographical imbalance in the ward um having said which that then I think plays into several aspects of what the community forum as an organization does. 
So uh, I got involved with this five years ago and um, I was extremely lucky that Chris Rand and Rebecca Jones came on board at the same time as me. They have both been invaluable in um, turning it into the, the force that it has today. <clears throat> and we came up with this strap line about making Queen Edith a better and brighter place to be. It's very important that people understand that the community forum is independent, non-aligned, by residents, for residents. And um, occasionally we will apply to the city council for funding for a specific thing which we would like to do. But in general, we are self-funded and um, that applies all the way through to the uh, COVID related activity that we're doing now. So that that is very important to us. Um, and I've said here that, you know, what we do is around three themes, really. It's about information, it's about places, and it's about people. So we have a email list of recipients of our Friday email roundup. And over the course of the pandemic, we have taken the numbers of subscribers to that up from under 600 to over 1300. People really want to know what's happening in their locality. We have a magazine which we uh, produce four times a year, goes out to now I think approaching 6,000 houses because we don't just take the city ward definition of Queen Edith, we see it as a functional area. So we deliver beyond the city ward boundaries in order to make, pe make sure that people who use the space know what's going on. Um, and that now is entirely delivered by volunteers as well. We had 130 people deliver the issue that went out uh, a couple of weeks ago. In terms of place, um, we have supported the Capturing Cambridge uh, project run by the Museum of Cambridge and all the work that's gone into um, the, the Queen Edith element of that. But we want to be forward looking. And that's why we did this place standard survey at the beginning of this year. I mean, it seems like it was decades ago, given how everything has, has moved on since then. Place standard is a piece of industry software, uh, industry standard survey uh, tool for measuring how people feel about the place they live in terms of these 14 different dimensions. Uh, we got about 250 responses, which is 5% of the adult population of Queen Edith's. And um, we were able to break the responses down. So this is the kind of amalgam for the whole ward, but we broke it down into four different areas and looked at the different issues that were arising for those four areas. And the plan was then to start doing some work around each of those four um, locations to see what, what could be done next. Unfortunately, all of that's been put on hold, primarily because of the third point there, which is about supporting people. And this year, that has become our absolute priority. So in conjunction with the local churches, we run the food hub at St. James's on a Saturday morning where we regularly get 50 people coming along, um, supporting about 150 people. Uh, we have a helpline, volunteer helpline, so if people are stuck at home because they're isolating or they're shielding, we can get jobs done for them. Um, we've run children's activities in Nightingale Park in the summer. We did a toy and children's clothes swap in the first lockdown when the uh, charity shops were closed and people couldn't get out to, to get stuff. Um, we, we've run activities as best we can through the whole process. And there has been the most enormously powerful coming together. I, I cannot speak highly enough of the level of participation which we have seen. And um, 
yeah, I could wax lyrical about that. I won't, but it has been humbling. And when I said, when I got the MBE, that it was for everyone in the community, it is for everyone in the community because I by myself could have done nothing. It was the coming together that made it all possible. So <clears throat> that's all very cheery and lovely. And, and now we have to go back to thinking about what's actually going on materially in the area. And I said, we live in the shadow of the biomedical campus. One of the consequences of that is the number of interventions which are made in our neighborhood in order to either try and get people on and off the campus more sustainably or to build housing such that hopefully people can live closer to where they work. So I just set myself the task of listing things that I could remember that have either happened since about what 2017 I think Hills Road Cycle Way started and the things we can see coming down the track um, and then of course the next local plan discussions ongoing five big development sites on the southern edge of Queen Edith's uh, totaling about 4,200 houses if they all came forward bearing in mind the size of the existing ward is about 4,500 houses that is a big concern it's a big thing to wrap our heads around it's a big thing to develop a response to the community forum will not be campaigning and taking a particular position on that but we will be doing our absolute utmost to make sure everybody understands what's happening and how they can have their say and that's what we've tried to do with all of these projects we've had um presentations to meetings from the CSET busway. We've had um, conversations with Cambridge South, which have been written up and published in the magazine. We talk endlessly to the many um, actors who are involved with all of these projects. Um, and it is absolutely imperative to me that people understand what's happening in their neighborhood because if they feel disconnected from that then they will not be willing to engage positively in their community and that then led me to think about this i think in queen edith's probably not uniquely in the city, but possibly more acutely than other places, we have some really visibly contested processes. So we have um, a disconnect between planning and transport on many scales. So for example, the fact that we're only talking now about how we're going to deliver Cambridge South when the growth of the biomedical campus has been known for 20 years. Um, or we can look at the new housing, which is going in on Warts Causeway, GB1, GB2, no sensible connectivity between those dwellings and the existing neighbourhood. We are plagued by the plethora of actors involved in advancing these plans. Uh, it makes it very hard for us and for residents to stay abreast of everything that's going on. It also means there are all sorts of gaps that things can fall through, excuses people can make. I sat through the discussion of Cambridge South Station at South Area Committee last night and the network rail spokesman when asked about the inadequacies of the bus access to this station said that's not our responsibility but couldn't describe whose responsibility it was and that's about the fourth time either I or someone else I know has had that conversation with them. Everything operates in silos. And it seems to me it's the people on the outside who have to do the heavy lifting in terms of trying to get the silos to talk to each other. And I can see Roxanne nodding and yeah, you know what I'm talking about. We've had some really bad examples of project management, uh, Hills Road Cycleways and um, 
Fendon Road roundabout uh, probably need no further comment at this point. Um, we also have fairly continuous disruption. If you if you think about the the projects I listed on the previous page and work out how they overlapped and how little respite there was between one project finishing and the next starting, it doesn't take much imagination to um, see how tedious and difficult that becomes over an extended period. There are concerns about transparency because of patchy engagement, um, perception that deals have already been done, so what's the point of even getting involved, um, and then when things have gone wrong, a level of, let's say, obfuscation and lack of clarity about accountability. There are, I think, fairly clear examples of where local needs and priorities have been overlooked, um, which is a bit of a slap in the face. And my contention would be that there is still no overall vision for how this neighbourhood can work next to the continued expansion of the biomedical campus, which will have 30,000 people working on it by the late 2020s. That is a size, a city, a city itself, the size of Chichester, or pick, pick your other lovely market town, but it's big, it's big. And those people are coming on and going off every day. And there has been no credible stepping up in their ability to access that site. <clears throat> so in the face of all that, how do we make Queen Edith a living neighbourhood? This is, this is my preoccupation. And I use the phrase living neighbourhood very deliberately. I think we can see ways of making it a low traffic neighbourhood, but that's not the same thing for me at all. So some things maybe we can talk about in the discussion are my provocation that infrastructure is necessary but not sufficient, how we can handle the um, cliche of the powerful cycling lobby, which has quite a lot of currency, <laughs> um, and, and how we can work harder at identifying the win-wins. And just a very simple example here. When Fendon Roundabout was being, dis the old roundabout was being dismantled, I said to the County Council, you're taking all the planting off. What are you going to do with it? And they said, we're going to chuck it in landfill. And I said, how about you dig it out and you make it available for residents to take away? And they said, oh, that's a bright idea. And that's what happened. They got their landscapers instead of digging it out and chucking it in skips to dig it out and put it on the side of the road. And we advertised it and on a Saturday morning, residents came along, stripped the place bare, saved the council the hassle of disposing of it, much more environmentally friendly, made people feel good, no cost. Versus my experience of the planters on Nightingale Avenue, where I approached the GCP to say, wouldn't it be nice if you talked to the people who live immediately adjacent to those to see how they'd like them planted because you know next summer when it's hot you're not going to be out there watering them right you you're going to need other people to be doing that it's going to cost you nothing other than an hour of your time to be polite to people and talk to them about what's going on in the neighborhood particularly given that this is not an uncontroversial intervention and I got told that was completely impossible. It's completely impossible to have an hour's conversation with the people who live next door to this. And I think that is a pitiful response. So when I talk about win-wins, it doesn't have to be anything clever or complicated. It's just actually being considerate and polite and acknowledging that people are invested in the place they live and would like to feel like they have 
some ability to influence what's going on around them. Uh, <clears throat> and then this is the final slide, you'll be very glad to hear. Um, I took this in Bristol. I think it's a lovely quote. I think it's uh, lovely imagery. And it's on the side of a thing called the Bristol Bike Project. And the thing I like about the Bristol Bike Project is that it is an organization which goes the extra mile. So they sell bikes, they restore bikes, but they have an after school bike project. They have an earn a bike scheme. So if you go along and do some maintenance with them, after you've put the effort in, you can walk away with the bike. They have all manner of things which combine social interaction and sustain, getting sustainable messages across and skilling people up and presenting a very positive presence on the street in what is a fairly down, down at hill neighborhood. It ticks lots of boxes for me. There is nothing I would love more than to see a space, preferably in Queen Edith's, but certainly in the city where we could actually engage in some of that wider work. Um, and it's that kind of thing that keeps me interested and keeps me pushing onwards. So that's it. Over to you, Roxanne. Thank you, Sam. That was so inspiring. Um, bear with me, a few buttons to push here. There we go. Excellent. Thank you, Sam. That was so inspiring. And you know, I knew some of that. I'd heard things, but it was more than I even knew. Um, the, the work that you and as you mentioned, the people around you were doing in Queen Eaters, I think is inspiring, not just for Cambridge, but for any local community. But I think perhaps something that local authorities should be paying attention to as well. Um, so before I start with all the questions I have, let's see if we've got some questions from our viewers. They have a slight delay, so we'll see what comes through. We'll start with mine. Um, I have a whole page of them. <laughs> um, basically, can how can we do this for Cam Cycle? Um, I think that you, what I found so interesting was this survey that you you did of local residents. I think you, you called it the um, place standard. Thank you, the place standard surveys. And I was just thinking, why on earth isn't our our local authority doing this for us? Why? Where is that community design coming from? It feels like we have things done to us, but no one's actually starting from the beginning to get from residents. What do you want to create a vision that then guides the projects that are done in our communities? Shall I tell you a little story? Please. So we decided that we were going to do this to inform our understanding of our area. After we'd start, oh, and I should say the place standard um, survey tool is free and open access. Anyone can do it. Okay. After we started doing it, we found out that the city council had hired a community development worker from Huntingdonshire. So they're not even using their own community development workers. They were paying someone from Huntingdonshire as a consultant to come and do a community survey not exactly the same, but near enough in Coleridge Ward. They got half the turnout that we did. I would argue that our results are much more reliable because we were using a, you know, um, established methodology and, and a tool that was well understood and, and has been developed by, by the Scottish government, in fact. Um, it made no sense to me at all that the city council were paying someone to do this work in Coleridge to less effect than a volunteer group could do for free in Queen Edith's. And I don't know what the block is, but there seems to be a, a version of 
community development work which doesn't always feel to me like it is community development work it feels like it is that doing two or maybe doing four but definitely not doing with or better still just saying what do you need us to do to get out of your way so you can do it for yourselves mm -hmm. absolutely and i imagine not every community has a organization like the queen leaders forum or they're not engaged yet but could the local authority start by helping to establish groups yes but, but they uh, are, the, the, the big the seeds are all over our community and if they weren't there before they're certainly there now yep. as a result of the pandemic and covid through our mutual aids you could we start to create to use the queen leaders forum as a template Yes, absolutely. And we've we've offered that in the past. I mean, you, you know, I cannot emphasize enough the role that Chris Rand has played in making all of this possible because he is the communications guru par excellence. Um, but the, the magazine that we produce, you know, we've offered the templates to that to the city council and said, do you want us to work with other groups? To, to, to get that off the ground? Do you want us to talk to them about how we managed to move to a model where we're producing a self-funded 24 page full color magazine four times a year? Um, you know, the, the business with the email list and how we've cultivated that to the point where it's got the reach. We are absolutely, absolutely willing to open our doors to anyone who would like to try and, um, you know, replicate what we've done ad adjusted for their circumstances because every locality is different and it's not a case of just taking what we do and doing it somewhere else that wouldn't work but in terms of making those tools available there is so much that could be done and um it's been great to see the mutual aid come forward in areas of the city where perhaps they didn't exist previously um and i'm really excited to know if they have plans to now evolve into something that will endure beyond the the immediate requirements of the pandemic well i can say as a committee member of the romsey mutual aid it's the kind of conversations that we're having now is what do we do with this uh tool you know in a way it is a tool for the community to yeah. talk to each other it's not just the people but we've created the ways of communicating the mailing lists the engagement what happens next and what elements of the mutual aid keep going even yeah. beyond the initial pandemic need because we have uncovered challenges in the community people that maybe weren't being looked after before that we've now can look after in new ways. Right, anyway, we've had our little chat and in that time, lots of questions have popped up. So I'll put my list to the side for now. Uh, and oh my goodness, here's a quick one. Are you still a CAM Cycle member? And are you willing to state that? Uh, yes, I'm a CAM Cycle member. I have been since about 1995, I think. Well, that would be since about the beginning. If you like, I can look uh, up. Maybe not, maybe not, well, it did make me um really wince quite hard when i realized it's almost 20 years since the chris boardman thing so um if if it's not 25 years it's quite a lot of years mm -hmm. i guess we then follow up is if you're not so busy do you want to come in and and get involved in the committee <laughs> the trustee group again <laughs> okay on to some questions so um from Anna, uh, of course, this is going to be a great question about community engagement. So what are your recommendations for growing community engagement in other areas? Where should people start? And I think I'll add on to that a couple of just those really key tactical questions are like, you say you're self-funded, where do you get funds from? You know, what you mentioned, um, the skills that Chris and I, was it Re Rebecca? Yeah. Rebecca Jones. You know, what were those skills that they bought that really helped you to just get the whole thing started? <clears throat> um, <laughs> I would say Chris and Rebecca's main skill was tolerating me. Um, so, so, so we did that that kind of three part plan about information, uh, people, and place. I guess has always been there from the start. It helped that we had complementary interests. So Chris's interest was the communications. 
Rebecca's interest was um, around green spaces and Nightingale Garden, the, the community garden that started in, in Nightingale Park where the, the um, bowls club had been. That, that is her project. And she and the volunteers that she created there um, have done amazing work. If you've ever seen any photos of it in the summer when the, the wildflower meadow is, is in full bloom, it is a beautiful place. And what that then made me do was think about space. You need space where you can get people together and get people invested. And um, that then led on for, for example, to the work we did to get Joy's Garden released to us. So this is a, a very small plot on the corner of Bulldog Way and Hills Avenue that um, the city council still intend to build housing on, but they don't have a plan to do it immediately. So it was fenced off, it was inaccessible, it was a site of fly tipping, it was um, extremely unsightly for the neighbourhood and it took four years of asking nicely and then asking less nicely to say to them why is it better to have this fenced off than to take the fencing down and make it available as a meanwhile garden and they finally did it in September last year and Again, space, physical place, people come together in there still, even this morning when I was over there, there are people sitting, eating a bag of chip seeds on the benches and having, having a chat. It's cost us nothing. It's, my husband might argue with that because he was the one who sanded the benches down. But you know, basically, it's cost us nothing other than time and um, goodwill. And the the... I guess if you're talking tactics, you look for small and manageable things that you can open up, that people can identify with, give them, give them a purpose, give them a way to see that they have some agency and they can deliver good outcomes for themselves. Is that an answer? I think that's an answer. And the yeah. comm side is absolutely critical. You know, if we if Chris hadn't have work had worked so religiously on the comm side we wouldn't be in a position to have done half of what we've done because we simply couldn't get the word out to people. And we've absolutely insisted on always having paper communications as well, because we know that just relying on digital is not enough. Yeah, I think I can see parallels with what CamCycle works on as well. Um, you, we notice when there is a, an issue that people can get engaged with because sometimes the the planning applications that we see they're so huge they're just so insurmountable that people can't quite engage with them but when it's something this is in my area I can understand this issue and I am either happy with this or unhappy with this then they come to camp cycle and we see membership go up in those particular areas and likewise paper communications when we do our cycling newsletter leaflets which we need, we're trying to do in more and more communities now because we see the engagement go up when people yep. get something through through their letterbox. How did you start from, from zero to getting all of your, your members? Was that through just, you start with one street, you talk to people, you put leaflets through, you advertised. How did you actually get enough people to get the word of mouth, to get more people, to get more volunteers, to do more leaflets, to get more people engaged? Yeah, I mean, it took us, it took us four years to build a mailing list of 500 people and it's taken us eight months to build a, an extra uh, whatever, I can't do the math, take it up to 1300. Um, yeah, again, it's about kind of um, giving people a reason to do it, you know, and, and that newsletter is not, that, that weekly email is not thrown together, that is carefully curated and we test the value of the information we put in it because if we send out rubbish to people they stop paying attention and one of the things Chris always comments on is the number of click-throughs we know how many people get it we know how many people open it and we know who clicks through to what and he says the click-through rates are higher than anything he's seen in his professional career because we make it relevant and because it's targeted 
brilliant and i think that shows it's it's so easy to say oh people don't engage with consultations or engage with these things they do when they can when it's delivered not just in a way that they can get the information but in ways that people can understand and then click to something that they know will be useful and worthwhile they do engage it's so easy to write it off as people don't care they do care if they're not caring it's because people aren't doing their job to get the information to people yeah it's this whole thing about hard to reach no they're not hard to reach you're not making enough effort to reach them mm -hmm. yeah um, we've had a, a comment from Matthew Danish saying how Boston has organizations like the Bristol Bike Project, but he'd been quite surprised to find um, that we don't have much like that locally. You know, we've got our bikes, but we don't have that kind of community type of environment. I've wondered if it's perhaps just that cycling in Cambridge is there are so such high rates of it that it's just not been a thing. <clears throat> I think I think it's two things. One is premises because space in Cambridge is at such a premium, it's very difficult to find premises where you can host these kinds of not-for-profit activities. Um, the other, I think, thing that I've learned quite recently is um, we uh, hosted two of the outspoken bike maintenance days using the, the 50 pound voucher thing. And we, advertised it through the email and they went you know within a very very short period of time and then i was chatting to someone at the food hub and because they're not so hot on digital they'd missed it and so we've got a third day book now with outspoken and we are reserving all of those slots for people who we have found personally who we know are not going to just come to us through the, the sort of default electronic means. We've actually gone and asked questions and used word of mouth and built trust from the initial lady. And we've now got 12 slots filled by people who would otherwise have been kind of invisible. And they're people who don't have the funds to take bikes to bike shops and don't necessarily have the skills all the time to fix it for themselves. The original person is a single mom with three kids. She, the thing she needed doing to her bike was not very complicated. But if I'd said to her, oh, you just do this or look it up on YouTube, you know, end of conversation. And and the reason I would be passionate about get something, something like the Bristol Bike Project here is because of that hand holding and the confidence building and the social side and the the trust and the community that you can get out of doing those sorts of things with people mm. we may have planted the seed of an idea i'd love that <laughs> i'll put that out to the to the members um so if simon says thank you for the awesome talk um and particularly for the great quotes at the end uh, and he would like to know, does Queen Edith's have a festival? And it's something we've talked about, Sam. Uh, have they ever organized a ride around the ward? Um, and where does the identity of Queen Edith's lie if it is not the roundabout or the marvelous Queen Edith's pub? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so you're now just known for the roundabout. Apparently that, that's all we need to know about Queen Edith's. Oh, dear God. Um, Sam, festivals and, and things that maybe would have happened if we hadn't had a pandemic. Yeah. So interesting, interesting you should mention the idea because probably what well, this time last year, Roxanne and I had a chat and I said, I'd really like to run a cycling event in Cambridge, uh, in Queen Edith as part of the cycling festival. And the city council has a funding round which groups like ours can apply to. So we put the application in in January uh, for £900 and the idea being that we'd get match funding from local companies and um, we had all sorts of ideas for what we we're going to do because we very much want to make sure that journeys in our local area are made by sustainable means wherever possible because we know that there's this constant influx of people from a long way away coming to the campus who will not necessarily choose to travel sustainably so it seemed like a really good idea and then covid happened and um 
I started talking to the city council about sort of community responses to COVID and they said, well, we haven't got any money. And I said, well, okay, we'll give you our 900 quid back and go and talk to the other people who've had grants from you in this funding round, who now won't be able to do the projects for which they wanted the money and ask them if they're willing to give it back. And lo and behold, that 14,000 pounds went back into the pot and then they gave each ward group a thousand pounds and that kind of seeded the COVID stuff. So we were very close to having a Queen Edith Cycling Festival and um, when things settle down, I would like to think we can actually make it work. And we were talking about it connecting with other activities. So there were, was more of festival type activity around that time, even if it wasn't just cycling. But um... yes, yeah, so we do we do a, um, an environment day on a Saturday in September. And we were gonna we were gonna make it a two parter to so do the environment day on the Saturday and the um, cycling day on the Sunday. So we had all sorts of good ideas. We'll come back to it. Yes, when the festival will be back, and uh, I guess that's a, a shout out to other areas that might like to organize events as well. Campcycle doesn't have to do the organizing, but we can help with the promoting and the turning up and and so on um, under the umbrella of the festival, or indeed at any time of the year. Um, Excellent. Okay, we'll um, we'll skip the part about the identity of Queenie that's lying just in the roundabout. Um, <laughs> although you do know you get a lot of roundabout tourism now. Um, you might not be aware, but I get a lot of emails about people who have come just for the roundabout um, to visit. Wouldn't it be nice if there was something else for them to do while they were here? <laughs> yes, um, we do point that out as well. We point out other great inf cycling infrastructure they can look at. Um, joking. Okay. Um, another question from Edward. So um, uh, again, praise for a great presentation. Um, he says that one premise of all the local development is the concentration of large employers. Um, what effect should post-pandemic remote working having, have on the um, trajectories for local employment growth and then <coughs> local residential growth? Um, and I guess there's that but then there's also a lot of employment at the biomedical site that clearly needs to be on site uh, but possibly more remote working could change some of their predictions what do you think okay so um i've done two hours on teams this afternoon with the uh, greater cambridge shared planning service presenting the local plan um and a lot of questions were raised around whether the evidence base they've compiled so far and that they released a couple of weeks ago actually has any validity in the face of COVID and the change to people's working patterns. And there was a lot of pushback from people in the room about that and a fairly lukewarm response from officers. So I don't know where that discussion will go. Um, it always seems remarkable to me that jobs are being created hand over fist on the biomedical campus and yet when housing is developed five ten minutes walk away from it housing for people working on the campus is not prioritized so um, one of the reasons i try and play pay such close attention to planning applications is because when the nine wells development was um, proposed the social housing element is there is largely accounted for by a thing called Warburton House, which is dedicated housing for the over 55s, not sheltered housing, just flats, but you have to be 55 or upwards to move in. And that seems like the most tremendous missed opportunity that, that, that it's a dumb place to put people who are over 55. There's nothing there. They could, that development could and should have gone somewhere where there were facilities and amenities and access to a GPs and so on. And that space should have been used for key worker housing. And so with the discussion over the housing on Walks Causeway, GB1 and GB2, I keep saying, why is the 40% affordable housing here not being ring fenced for key worker housing for the campus? Like how hard is it to join that up? The answer I am told is very hard. 
which brings us back to this whole nonsensical silo business. And it's something I fight with every sinew because it makes no sense to me. Um, I think if we took a, a more realistic approach to people's likely future working patterns, if we were less hung up on the idea of physical co-location as a way of getting agglomeration benefits, and if we put housing for the people who need to be near the site there, regardless of their income level, we would actually have solved quite a lot of problems which are currently tying us in knots and mean that Queen Edith will be a development site for many years to come. And I guess tied in with that is also the, the <laughs> creating more jobs than homes. Uh, yeah. we... Again, that was the logic of that was challenged this afternoon. You know, the, the, um, the officer said the economy will grow. So therefore, we have to provide the houses. And at what point is someone actually going to take a, de a deep breath and think about the first part of that uh, equation and go, does it need to happen here? Is it good that it's happening here? How much more overheating do we need here? And I, I just don't know where that kind of critical perspective is coming from, but it's really required in my opinion. So we have a question from Martin. Um, how do you get the balance right between being critical of management of public works versus not coming across as being against the principle of the changes? So you know, we clearly know at Hills Road, the Dutch roundabout, you know, we know that you cycle, you've been involved in cam cycle, but clearly there's some criticism of the schemes or the process of getting the schemes in place. How do you balance that? Well, I don't know that I get the balance right. <laughs> I'm sure there are plenty of people who would say I'm far too negative and far too critical. Um, and, and yeah, I can I can see where they're coming from. Um, I feel very strongly that people who are being paid to do a job should do the job properly. And I feel very strongly that councillors who are making decisions about which jobs will be done and how they will be done should be accountable for those decisions. And if pointing up when those things aren't happening is negativity, then yes, I will hold my hand up and say I'm guilty. Um, I, I think the obfuscation around the costs of Fend and Roundabout are corrosive to public trust in any future cycling scheme. And we've seen it now with the Chisholm Trail, you know, and it's it's you, Roxanne, who are standing there and engaging on social media and trying to explain the merits of that scheme. You, why are you exposed to that? I, I It makes no sense to me at all. What The Cambridge South example, you know, I have an officer standing there telling me that it's none of his business if there's enough bus parking. Why is it me and Edward Lee and Rail Futures and Cam Cycle who are trying from the outside as volunteers to bang heads together to get decent outcomes? I think it's very it's very easy to criticise that as or, or characterise that as negativity if. If people were doing their jobs properly, we wouldn't need to be negative, would we? Mm. And and I guess I, I think it's important as well that we, this is also not just cycling schemes, this is happening with just about every project that's being delivered right now. There is a serious systemic problem here and it will only undermine future works um, that we want to be seen positive. I mean, it's no end of frustration for CamCycle that flagship amazing schemes are just, we lose the excitement because of all the budget issues that come with them. Yeah. There's some, we need to find out what is going on there. Yeah. But I think it's quite interesting that, you know, we talk about that balance, but it wasn't so long ago that both you and I arrived um, for the BBC One interview at the roundabout. And, you know, you were there to say, well, I've got issues about the, the budget and so on. And I was there to say how great this piece of infrastructure is here. And I think that the 
the presenter of the show was a bit oh you you know each other and you're all getting along just fine it's like yes because these are all the pieces of conversation we need to be having in in public life and we can talk about projects the good and the bad about projects without it being personal right <laughs> yeah and and without it being polarized yeah yeah it is it's polarization is completely um counterproductive you don't go anywhere mm -hmm. and i and i know that there have been conversations around cycling infrastructure and proposed cycling infrastructure in green Eaters, which have got very 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 hot under the collar um and I, I don't think that's going to help us get good outcomes. And I want good outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's also it's about coming back to actually we are all after the same thing here. We want positive, vibrant, engaged communities that are safe, that people can get around sustainably with clean air. We just might not all agree on quite how we get there, but it's about having that conversation that we hopefully get the best outcomes um, in the long run. Um, yes, which is why we ran um, a couple of workshops in January, I think, again, feels like a decade ago, um, specifically around the area around Queen Edith's Way, to try and lubricate what had become some quite stuck positions around what could be done there. Um, and, you know, not positioning this as being about cycling infrastructure, it's about what will make that a place that works in all senses. And I, and I think, you know, unfortunately, because, because there are budgets associated with transport infrastructure projects, it's always the transport thinking that dominates rather than a, a more holistic approach. You know, it's, it's like the Hills Road cycleways, come back three years later and put a load of trees in wouldn't it have been better if that scheme had been designed with the trees in from the start and with suds such that those trees wouldn't have died on their asses in their first year and panic stricken messages going out to, to householders to please go and chuck some water on the trees. You know, it's just, it's unnecessary. I think that a big contributor to this, or these are all symptoms of not planning our communities and our neighborhoods from the start as a whole and that is the whole picture for transport but also the whole picture for our what is our way of life going to be like what will our streets feel like what community facilities do we need all those things you've shown us the survey the what's in my neighborhood what do i need where should it be doing that first but because of the way funding and this is where i feel for officers because they have to operate within a system of piecemeal funding putting yeah. together pieces with inconsistent objectives and requirements and somehow improve transport and community life and it seems if it's a big road project that's easy but anything local uh, and and seen as smaller um, is a lot harder to do and then that's where we end up with the issues we have now uh, but i must get on because there's more questions um, Tim wants to know if you have interaction with residents associations or are you the new kind of residents association? Um, I, I personally would struggle to come up with the definition of a residents association. Um, so for example, I, I don't think we are one because um, I think we cover too big an area maybe we're too i don't know there's something about us that makes me think we're not a residents association um if i think about the residents association that associations that do exist in queen Edith's, you've got hills road queen Edith's way um red cross lane who have been very late comers to this they've only been around for a year and have done amazing work because they're really very very focused Nine Wells, Babraham Road, um, Litchfield Road. So the, those are the big six. And then there are small, and I guess those six have all to a greater or lesser extent had some kind of campaigning focus. So like the Nine Wells one, their campaign was just to get Hill to finish the blooming build properly and leave them with a playground that wasn't flooded for nine months of the year and stuff like that. They, uh, 
it feels to me like those big six ha all have some kind of campaigning focus but then there are loads of little ones which are just social you know rathmore road there's there's one on the north side and one on the south side and they both have summer socials in the driveways behind their houses and and that's what they do and that's really nice so i guess i see the community forum as a way of providing information to those residents associations and then they can choose what they want to do about it if they want to use that information to campaign on something that's relevant to them then you know great was that the question yeah i think so more than answered um i guess tom's come back with a, a his question you asked how to counter the all-powerful cycling lobby uh and he's saying that i suggest that you cannot but i think you were saying more this perception of the all-powerful cycling lobby because tom's pointing out it's a conspiracy theory but i think you are somewhat agreeing do you want to i put i put it in quotes and i very nearly put a wink emoji next to it and then i thought that was too cheesy for words so i didn't but yes i am um I am not a uh, person who buys into the all powerful cycling lobby theory, but it is a real belief that some people have. And I think it's it's more a question for you as an organization and as individuals about what you want to do about it, um, because because it does it does color how people see cam cycle and cycle campaigning and how they interact with it do you think so i think the further to what tom has said he said that um uh perhaps when you try and engage rationally it seems to further entrench that view um, you know there's no amount of explaining that is is possible to do when when people have sort of bought into such a theory do you think that's true i mean you're out talking to people that we're, it's probably hard for us to engage to who who are those maybe undecideds that you know, we can talk to or are, i guess i'd like to know how deep is that that view and and what do you think we could do about it when i was talking to to claire mccray doing my research for this um UCL essay that I'm writing about critical mass and, and care recycling campaign. She talked about the experience of being on the stall on the market. You don't do that anymore, do you? Do you? Uh, no, well, definitely not at these times. Yeah. Um, but she said, you know, language was very important and she um, turned her question, are you a cyclist, into do you ride a bike? And I don't know if that's still part of your kind of mantra and framing, but I think that's really important. And I think that the sort of psychological overtones of a cyclist now are probably more off putting than they were in 95, 96. Um, and I, I would I would suggest that the way to counter it is to look for those win-wins that I was talking about um, because those then are not pitting cyclists against non-cyclists they are bringing together people who ride bikes and people who don't ride bikes but also have concerns for their quality of life. Mm -hmm. I think it's very fascinating how despite there not being anything really I think CamCycle has ever done that would suggest that we're mammals and we're all about road cycling I mean that's just never been in anywhere in the history of anything we've done but we still get somehow associated with that and I, and that is intentional by people who know that we're not like that but want to attack us but then there is this overall I think it, message that comes from the media if not locally nationally and so on that we've been swept up in and i think we just have to keep doing our good work as you said it's about that language it's about the imagery we're putting out and we just got to continue to be putting our practical professional helpful points of view across right we must keep going but i think we're nearly up um with our time so um Quick question, do you know what the plans and progress are on the Coton Cycleway? Is that, that's not really... <laughs> sorry, no. I <laughs> know uh, that one might be for me and I, I'm sorry, I don't have an update. I think that one's a bit confusing. So sorry, Andrew, but if you send us an email, we'll, we'll try and help you there. Um,
Great question from Finlay. Any, any joy with getting young people involved in this sort of community activism? Um, and as, as Finlay knows, as our, our young trustee, even though people might not believe that he's only, as I'm not allowed to say your age, Finlay, but he's very young, um, but he's finding it's hard to get his perhaps friends who are 20 somethings involved, 20 um, something years old, engaged with CAM Cycle and, and other organizations. So how are you going with young people? Well, um, the, the really nice and surprising thing for me is that we've actually gone beyond Finley's generation. Um, we have had quite a lot of buy-in from teens. Now, it might be um, slightly self-interested in their part that they want things to put on their personal statements for university applications and so on. But certainly during the school summer holidays, we had, you know, three, four teenagers every Saturday working at the food hub. Um, I was biking home from the food hub this Saturday, just gone, and I saw two teen girls dog walking. There's a, there's a lady um, with two dogs who's been forced to shield again, and we've had to organise the most complex dog walking rotor known to mankind. Um, but the but the teenagers like doing that, you know, they they want to go out and be social within the terms that they're currently allowed to. So dog walking suits them fine. Um, I, I would say possibly we've been weaker on getting the 20 somethings involved. Uh, and maybe that's predictable because they've got other things going on at the moment and more precarious circumstances themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Finlay, he's 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 said it, so I can say it. he's twenty six. So there we go. He didn't look a day over forty five on the call at South Area Committee last night. <laughs> um, right, and do, do bear with me. I'm just making sure I've captured the yep. questions, um, and there's a lot of things to look at. So um, just got lots of supporting sort of here here type of comments, lots and lots of retweets on Twitter. So. Um, certainly engaging with people and 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 lots from Anthony Carpet who also does a great yeah. job of oh of he does involved. he really yeah. does yeah I'm just hoping now I haven't said anything too libelous but okay it's a fine line we all must walk uh, there's just so many bits on Twitter that are trying to find the questions but I think I've captured them all. So I'm going to do the last rounds. Any final comments or questions, please do get them in. Chris Rand has chipped in saying um, he's, he's very flattered by all the praise. And I can I can agree. I've been I've worked with Chris through Smarter Cambridge Transport as well. And he's absolutely fantastic. And he is very interested in sharing what we've learned about comms on a hyper local level with other areas of the city. So yeah. there we go. Chris has made the offer. And Chris, I'm we're not a local area, but I would like to chat to you because I've already had a few ideas sparked that I think <laughs> I'd like to find out the cam cycle. Um, so I'll take you up on that myself, Chris. Uh, and there we go. So let me do my final check on um, Facebook. Finley's agreed that he aged a good 10 years on that. Um, oh, it was grim. It was so grim. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. That's what, perhaps that's a, a challenge with engaging is, is just don't have enough years to, to sit through it all. Um, but I think that's it. So Sam, I'm going to say a huge thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I found it very inspiring and, and I think that a lot of other local groups will too. Uh, and I guess I must also then say thank you for all the amazing work that you do do. Um, even though sometimes we don't agree, I think it's what gets us to a better outcome. And I'm so pleased that we've got champions like you in our communities. Well, the, um, the the respect is mutual, Roxanne, and um, given that cycling provided the arena for me first sticking my toe in the water, as I said, with the long road stuff, um, I, I think the work Cam Cycle does is brilliant and more power to your elbow. Thank you. Thank you so much. So here we do our, our virtual round of applause. Um, thank you, Sam. You you can go and have a, a, a cup of tea now. Put your thank feet you. up. <laughs> Um, excellent. Uh, so I will farewell Sam and I will get my screen up and give a few campaigning updates. Um, thanks, Sam. Okay. And let's get the next. 
part of our updates online. And if anybody's got any other updates um, or questions about campaigning, please do share them. I will do my best. I'm not always the font of all knowledge. So um, we'll see what we can get answered for everybody today. Here we go. Cam Cycles Cycling News Updates. So the first thing for everyone is we mentioned the Big Give Christmas Challenge earlier, but um, we also have the Co-op Local Community Fund. So if you are not a member of the Co-op already, you can join. And then each time you shop, if you scan your card, you earn points that you can then choose to give to a local cause. And we would love it if you chose CamCycle as that particular cause. Um, please send us an email if you're having any challenges, you can't get it to work. We're more than happy to, to talk you through it. Um, but we those, those points are ticking up and we are raising funds through the co-op. So thank you to everybody who's um, sharing those points with us. We really appreciate it. Um, in other news, uh, next, the next time we shall all see each other will be January next year for our AGM. Uh, so please do get this date in your diary, 2 p.m. Saturday, the 23rd of January. And I've just realized I should have updated this slide because our guest speaker is none other than Melissa Bruntlett of Modacity fame and author of um, Designing the Cycling City. There's so many Cycling City books. I believe it's the Designing the Cycling City book. And there is another book coming out soon, which she'll tell us about. Um, but Melissa and her partner, Chris, moved their family from Canada to the Netherlands recently. And we're really interested to hear what that experience has been like to, to move to the cycling heaven. Has it lived up to everything they hoped it would? Um, and what lessons can we learn from that? So this is an amazing top-notch guest speaker for us. So I do hope that you will join us online. There'll be lots of information coming out in the coming um, days and weeks about the AGM, how to join, how to RSVP. Um, but you, you must register and with an email address so that we can arrange the various voting uh, forms and invitations that are required for the trustee elections. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you in January for the AGM. Uh, and of course, if we're talking about the AGM, we must also mention the uh, trustee elections. Um, please do get in touch if you are interested in finding out more about being a trustee. Um, we've got a very high satisfaction from our trustees. We survey every year and we find out how trustees feel about the work they're doing and it's very rewarding and satisfying. So you know that you'll have that um, and you don't need to be um, experienced as a trustee and you don't need to be someone who knows everything about cycling and bikes or about cycling infrastructure. Uh, we've got plenty of those people. <laughs> what we're really interested in are, are the people who, who understand what cycling can do for our local communities, for our environment, for our way of life. And you, know, you might be someone who cycles the kids to school um, and that might be it. That's enough. Um, so don't, don't rule yourself out. Please come and have a conversation. Um, and we must say you know, we're really keen to make sure that we're getting representation from across the different areas of Cambridge and, and beyond, as well as different people in our community. So uh, we're very keen to talk to, to different people. So please get in touch and we'll tell you more about it. If being a trustee sounds like a, a, a step too far, don't worry, there are some other, other things that you can get involved with. Um, so volunteering opportunities, we've mentioned um, trusteeship, but there's also work that can be done helping with our website and our magazine. Uh, we're also calling for people to help provide us with photos, videos, stories, quotes, and so on to help with our campaigning over the coming weeks for Spaces to Breathe. So there's a lot of consultations going on at the moment about the uh, various schemes that have been implemented temporarily. Should we keep them? Should we change them? Um, and would really like to, to hear those stories and share those stories with the community to help people uh, decide how they feel about the schemes. Um, and also we've got tranche two coming up. So if there's not a scheme in your area and you'd like one, perhaps you could share something 
uh, about what you'd like to see for your local area and we can help campaign for the next round of changes in Cambridge. Uh, to support this work, we're also doing our cycling news leaflets out to houses and we've just heard from Sam about how making sure that we give people things on paper is so important. Um, so in the coming week, we'll be printing up cycling newsletters for the Abbey area and the Mill Road area. So if you can help deliver in those areas, please send us an email. And if you would like leaflets in your area and you can help us coordinate those, then do get in touch because we would love to get out into more communities. Uh, we also have lots of local organisations that we are supporting by connecting them with cycling volunteers who can help with deliveries. Um, so you can see on our website, um, there's a whole list of, of places that are looking for volunteers. And if you're looking for excuses to get out on your bike and helping the community, that's where you should be looking. So here is an update on the Spaces to Breathe campaigning. Uh, there are consultations happening for Nightingale Avenue, Carlisle Road, Stories Way, um, and I believe I'm forgetting some streets, but those consultations are happening now. So please do go and email the County Council saying that, yes, please, we like these schemes. Uh, perhaps they could be improved with nicer barriers, with more planting. Uh, do let them know how they could be improved. And of course, let them know if there are places you would like to see more schemes. That's the email address to use. Uh, and we're also really ramping up our campaigning around the bus gate on Mill Road. We know this is really um, quite a, a heated topic, um, but we, it's really important that we help people think about what they would like this space to be like in the coming year, uh, because we're not going to be through this pandemic straight away. There are still going to be many months, possibly another year of, of various levels of distancing or, or different ways of being around other people. So what would that mean for a place like Mill Road? Um, and what do we imagine it could be like? So we're asking people to, to tell us what they'd like to see on Mill Road next year, and then use that to inspire people to respond to the consultation about Mill Road uh, and broadly Cam Cycles position is the bus gate should stay. Uh, there needs to be some level of creating extra space for people walking and being on Mill Road, but the temporary barriers that are currently being used to create those build outs simply aren't attractive or appropriate. So something else needs to be done there. But we'd really like to hear your views as well. So send us an email or get onto Cyclescape. Tell us what you think about Mill Road. Help us shape this campaign. But please do make sure that you respond. Um, and likewise, we're looking for those photos and those stories to help us uh, share this with the community. Now, just around the corner from Mill Road, or basically on Mill Road, is Devonshire Gardens. So this is um, a new development proposed for the Travis Perkins site on Devonshire Road and Mill Road. It will have implications for the Chisholm Trail, which needs to, to somehow move through that space. Uh, and, and of course, it will have implications for the Mill Road area with more housing coming in. So uh, I do urge our members to take a look at the Devonshire Gardens uh, website. They have a number of workshops and events coming up so you can uh, register for those. And they have some form of consultation out at the moment asking for views about Mill Road. Uh, it's not an official consultation, so I'm not recommending that you should or shouldn't respond to that, but it's there for your information if you'd like to take a look and share your views on Mill Road. And while we're in that area, I just thought I would share this rather shocking photo of the Cambridge Retail Park, which has still not reinstated the missing bollard or, or rising bollard that they took out many months ago, years ago now. Um, and what we're seeing is quite a lot of through traffic through this site now, making it uh, a lot more dangerous than it should be. Uh, but the, the managers of the site are now very proud that they've installed more cycling infrastructure like um, painted on cycle wet lanes alongside parking spaces and the classic situation of bikes going in the wrong direction. So it's very, very confusing at that site. So I do urge people to maybe make a bit of noise about that and include in that your request for that bollard to be reinstated. 
Now, um, some of these are repeats from last month. So just a quick reminder of consultations. We've got the Southeast Cambridge, the Cambridge Southeast Transport, Better Public Transport and Active Travel Consultation. So that is about um, connecting the biomedical campus to the South um, employment sites through Shelford, Stapleford to uh, Babraham Granter Park. So we're talking about um, what they're calling travel hubs, but we would probably still call park and rides. Um, so please do take a look at that. Uh, the Cats Cambridge South Station consultation closed a few days ago, but I've put this up just to let people know that CamCycle has responded. There should be a blog post on our website, but it's decided to disappear on me, but we'll get that up and running ASAP so that you can read our response. But broadly, we agree with the uh, response that was put in by Smarter Cambridge Transport um, and developed with Rail Future, and it was mentioned by Sam in her talk today. So um, just to let people know that will be up online for you to take a look at. There's also things happening for the Water Beach area. So the Water Beach to Cambridge consultation about off-road public transport and active travel is online now. So please do respond to that. We also have the Cambridge Eastern Access um, consultation with the GCP. There's a, a range of options that they're consulting on and we are particularly interested in what they're suggesting for Newmarket Road and ensuring that Newmarket Road is significantly improved for cycling and walking. Uh, but we are finding that the materials that have been put out by the GCP are somewhat confusing. So um, we're working on creating some of our own maps here to actually point out where the proposed improvements for cycling infrastructure in that area will link up with what already exists and that sort of helps to put things in context to see what we should be prioritizing. Uh, definitely don't have time to go into lots of detail there and we're still just working out what CamCycle's position on this will be um, but absolutely we must be getting the on-road cycling infrastructure improved and then we need to look at what happens in and around the green spaces so please do take a look at the Eastern Access Study. And of course, that then has implications for the Mill Road area as well. There is also in that area, the East Barnwell conversation. So this is more about what should the area be like as a community, but as we know that transport interacts with that in many ways. So um, touching on the Eastern Access consultation, what should that actually do for the local community? Um, and all of this adds up to, uh, you're trying to improve our impact on our environment and the climate. So the Cambridge City Council also has their climate change strategy that they are consulting on. So you may like to respond to that as well. So before I summarize everything for the evening, I'm just taking one final look on Facebook and Twitter to see if there's any questions. And I'll, while I do that, I'll remind everyone that the Big Give is still up and running. <laughs> There's lots of thanks for Sam, that is excellent. There we go. So no more questions, no more points that I may have missed, which means we are nearly ready to head to our online pub. Excellent. I think I've done the job for December. So I will sign off by saying thank you so much to everybody who has worked incredibly hard in incredibly challenging times this year. Um, the year did not pan out how we thought it would. We had great plans for reach rides and festivals of cycling. And instead, I think we've seen some of the most um, impressive campaigning we've ever done and we've made some great strides forward. So thank you to our members and our volunteers who have stuck with us, helped us through this time helped us reach even higher rates of membership, um, more donations than ever, so that CamCycle is in an incredible position for the work that we need to do next year. So Merry Christmas, everybody, or uh, Merry Winter Celebration, whatever it is for you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, best of luck for the new year, and we will see you in January. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>